Cheers, guys. Epics 911, welcome to the Saturday, January 14th, 2017 edition of VR News. Not quite as much going on today as in days past, but a couple of cool, interesting news pieces, uh, one of which pretty thought-provoking. But let's start with the Royal Shakespeare Company and their use of virtual reality technology. Now, this article starts with probably one of my favorite quotes, top 10 and that is from Arthur C. Clarke, which is, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And we'll get back to that. But what the Royal Shakespeare Company is doing is they have a partnership with Intel and a company called the Imaginarium. And they are pioneering a new kind of storytelling te technology using and technique using Shakespeare's plays, specifically The Tempest, as kind of a guinea pig for it. And what it's going to be is basically the world's first live motion capture performance. So think Gollum from Lord of the Rings, except on stage live and chatting you up in real time. Now, what I love about that is the company, Imaginarium, that they're doing this with is co-owned and co-founded by Andy Serkis, who's not only the actor who wore the motion capture suit for Gollum, but also his voice. So I thought that was kind of cool. But how they're going to do this is they've got 27 projectors hidden around the theater. The actor playing Ariel, Mark Hortley, he's on stage basically at all times, and he's got 17 motion sensors embedded in his costume. Those sensors are going to basically, whenever he performs magic, have a virtual avatar appear, track his movements, flying around the stage, transmogrifying itself, basically to fit the story's needs, which is super cool. Now, what I love about that quote in the beginning, and they don't mention this in the article, but kind of my thought on that, about it being technology being indistinguishable from magic, is the time we find ourselves in. I would not want to have been born in any other time. Victorian, Elizabethan, you know what? Roman, they're all cool to read about. As a history buff, I love reading about it. The fantasy of it is great. Maybe in a time machine visit for a few minutes, hours, days, weeks, no problem. Living there and having been born, hell no. I love my internet. I love my virtual reality. I love my technology, basically, right? But imagine taking Shakespeare out of the Globe Theater circa 1590s, right at the height of his his popularity. Well, I guess the height of his uh, stage plays being, you know, what we know them to be. And bringing him into this time and having him look at that version of The Tempest, that would basically bring Arthur C. Clarke's quote to life. And the irony of it, having Shakespeare, who wrote a play about magic, watching a modern version that to him would appear magic. <laughs> so I thought that was really cool. Hopefully when they're done with this, you know, it's filmed, whatever they end up doing, it's available for us via HMD. I would love to see that. It's one of Shakespeare's plays that I really, really enjoy and have seen so many times live. But this way would probably top them all for me. Very, very cool. All right, next news story. This one uh, is a device called Clazer. It's from a company called Lead Tech. Now, they basically do shooting sim tie-ins, shooting sims. That's what they're known for. Now, they have a patent that basically allows virtual reality players to use their own real-life guns. You would think as Canadians, yeah, they probably don't have that. Well, no. <laughs> One of my acquaintances, for example, owns several pistols and has a type of AR-15, you know, which are legal here in Canada, he would be able to use that, not just on the gun range, but in virtual reality, in the privacy of his home, own home. Very cool. I think that's very, very cool. And this is not like the Vive Tracker. This is technology that will simulate the full gun. Now, he 
I talked about the patents. So that's two patents that they have for a total of 54 claims, but they're working on a third patent that's pending that covers the VR gun controller mounted on a real gun. So uh, yeah, that's something that's going to probably be amazing to see. It's going to blur the lines between virtual spaces and real life. And arguably, it could help, you know, things like skill sets for for those guns, literally not having to go just, provided the physics are accurate, to a gun range, but being able to use it in all those scenarios, just honestly, for people who are into that, that's pretty damn cool. And it's going to be available for HTC Vive, Rift, and Gear VR. No word on things like Sony. If you were asking me for my best guess, I wouldn't hold your breath for it to appear there for obvious reasons, but Vive, Rift, and Gear, it will be on. Next news piece. This one is from Upload VR, and it has to do with content curation. And that simply means quality control. The author starts with talking about Vive. He talks about other platforms like Oculus. They haven't had any games released for a while, like big titles. There's always stuff trickling in. Uh, Sony PlayStation, he uses an example. No games in two, three weeks, and probably none until the Resident Evil gets released, which I believe is next week. And then he says, by contrast, the Vive doesn't have that issue at all. More games than you could probably ever play in a lifetime. But, and this is his argument, and I agree with part of this, the quality of so many of those games is absolute, utter cruft. Crap, right? Now, there's a couple of schools of thought. There's the school of thought that Steam should take the approach of companies like Nintendo. Now, the angry video game nerd probably wouldn't have had the career he has if it wasn't for the fact that back then on the NES, Nintendo really hadn't, you know, not they developed, but they hadn't perfected or refined is a better word, that quality technique. Because you and I know there are a ton of crappy, spectacularly crappy games on the original NES, really on any platform. But to Nintendo's credit, by the time it got around to the N64 and beyond, that process has gotten a lot better. Now, the, the author, he doesn't state this, but the concern that I have, having lived through the big video game crash, well, is that something similar could happen with Steam VR games. But, you know, after reflecting on that a bit more, I don't think so. Now, back then, with the Atari 2600, it was months leading up to the crash, a few months during it, and then a few months on the downward slope. And the reason was not just E.T., believe me. Yes, it was a bad game, but no, there were many more reasons. Many more crappy games that contributed to that big crash. And really, it wasn't a video game crash. I hate when I hear that. It was a console game crash because video game made for computers, they did damn well in 1983 and 84 and 85 before the console resurgence with the NES. There was no issue. In fact, they were more popular than ever. So yeah, that's one of those things that irks me whenever I read that. But going back to Steam VR, how do you assess that quality? One of the checks Steam is obviously put in place because they don't want to be you know, judge and jury for each game. And I can understand that. There's so many. So there's stuff like green lighting, but we know there's, you know, that's corruptible. It's not a perfect science. There's being able to return your game, rate your game. There are tools in place to tell others you don't want to tread here. It stinks. Now, I'm okay with that. I think that's as big brother as you need to get. So I don't agree with the with the writer of the article in as much that, you know, I don't think Steam could perfect that to the level he's hoping to, right? But there probably are things they could do on the consumer side, additional tools, refining those existing ones to really help get the point across even stronger 
that this game sucks. Maybe some kind of penalty system or whatever. Not for me to decide or you guys, uh, but hopefully somebody out there is giving it thought. But you know what? Right now, the way I look at it is there's more than enough games to keep people busy. But the good games or the, the, the really big blockbuster style games, they're going to come. They're going to trickle. But if you do a bit of reading, you check out the reviews, you look at the comments, most of the time you're going to get a fairly accurate view on whether it's worth it or not for you, right? Some people don't like certain genres and they'll penalize a game for that. That's the type of stuff you can usually pick up when you read those comments versus, yeah, this game crashes every three seconds, right? Genre will be damned in a case like that. So interesting article. Have a read. Let me know what your thoughts are on that. Like how do you think it should be policed or not policed at all? Love to hear your thoughts on that, guys. Next news story virtualrealitytimes.com is the source for this one. They have a summary listing of both full and partial body tracking solutions for virtual reality. I thought this was really cool because it's kind of having them all in one spot. It kind of backs up the statement that, you know, we use a lot here about there's going to be losers, there's going to be winners because not all of these solutions are going to survive. But hopefully the best aspects of those technology lives on. So have a look at the list. You've got stuff like hand pose, for example. That's based off of Kinect's technology, the Microsoft Kinect. You've got OptiTrack, which is for more wide area VR tracking. Think Star VR, bigger spaces. Perception Neuron, which is more of a mocap solution. And that's that tie-in when you talk about Shakespeare's play in the first news story, is how the lines have kind of blurred between motion capture and virtual reality. I think the two really complement each other well. And I think advances in one are going to lead to advances in the other, which is awesome. Uh, just really quick, you've got um, the STEM system from Sixth Sense, which is very similar to the Vive style system in that you've got a tracking unit in each hand and of course, one on your HMD. And then the last one, I actually hadn't heard of this one. It's called Xsense, Xsense, which is a 3D motion tracking system. It uses a camera and it's got uh, motion sensors, basically hand, wrist, elbow, bicep, shoulder, and head. So it's able to take that and articulate it on screen, movement and, and that sort of thing. So. Lots of cool technologies, but the question, not just who wins and who loses, but what are the aspects of each of those that get cherry-picked, what gets omitted as we move forward, you know? It's one of those things where 2019, 2020, we look back at this list. I'm going to try to remember that and see where it did end up going and what features did make the cut. So, very cool. Next news piece, Samsung patent filed back in July of 2016 appears to show a move towards a hybrid augmented virtual mixed device. Now, uh, in reading this, they've got a, a note here where they say figure 15, and that's the picture that I should have up, illustrates a method for outputting an object provided in a specific area by an electronic device according to various embodiments of the present disclosure. And it uses the example of some sports, live sports things, and how you can switch between augmented and virtual reality. For example, being at something front row and then maybe being in the nosebleeds, right? Right up in the bleachers if it's a concert. A lot of that is alluded to in the patent, but kind of in the usual legalese. But very interesting, that hasn't really been reported as far as I know, other than through next.reality.news, which is where I got it from. So another one to keep an eye out on. And then uh, lastly, uh, you know, a bit of a deeper one from Road to VR is simply VR as the most powerful surveillance tech or 
the last bastion of privacy up to us. And this is just another really good podcast from Kent by uh, on Road to VR. Have a listen to it. He's speaking to uh, Sarah Downey, who has experience working with digital privacy and privacy in the workplace, privacy in general. She's got a lot of experience with that. And she's on the side that it could be the last bastion for privacy. And some of the examples that she uses, I mean, they're really thought provoking. And she says her statement that our digital footprints are starting to bleed into our real lives. And this could lead to less authentic interactions in the real world, which is at the same time powerful yet ominous. Now, I, I understand what she's saying and the rest of what she says, and it all kind of comes to, to this summary that, look, think beyond cookies and, you know, some of the stuff that the advertising does online where they look at your browsing history and they use that. Another example is YouTube with the recommends. Sometimes they are uncannily spot on. And then other times it's like, why the hell did they recommend this to me? not in a million years would this be a video I would look at, right? So it's not a perfect science, but it's examples of where your real life actions are translating into data capture. Somebody's analyzing that. What about eye tracking? What about facial expression tracking? Just imagine just this, you know, a bit of a paranoia thing, which I'm not a real big, big fan of, but I'll indulge myself on on this fantasy and, and pretend. Imagine, you know, a society that has adopted VR mainstream and augmented some future company, maybe it's China or country, maybe China, maybe somebody else, but whatever. They've adopted it. They've perfected eye tracking, facial tracking, digital avatars that represent those people. Imagine somebody else maliciously gets access to all that information. You've basically got the blueprint for an entire society, classes of people captured. It's almost like you've cloned them digitally. So I can see both sides of the coin. Personally, I'm on the last bastion of privacy front. We had that introvert discussion. Quite happy with that. But again, love to hear your guys' thoughts on that. That's it for the news today, guys. Cheers as always, guys. Have a kick-ass weekend and... Catch you guys on the VR flip side.